Hi, and welcome to Car Corner. My name is Richard Saxton, and I'm the coordinator of the automotive programs at the Community College of Philadelphia. In today's episode, you'll see Dan Reed slide into action with his discussion on drift cars. If you have any questions about our programs at the college, please check us out at our website. Thanks, and have a great day. Hi, I'm Dan Reed with the Community College of Philadelphia's Automotive Technology Program. Welcome to Car Corner. Today, we have something special behind me. And I know right now it may just kind of look like an ordinary car, but in fact, with today's program, we hope to show you the difference between a normal street car and what's involved with driving or uh, building a true track car. And uh, what's really, really interesting is that the gentleman who built the car behind me his name is Joe Sheridan, and he's a student of Community College of Philadelphia. And Joe, why don't you come on out? Mr. Reed. Hey, how you doing? Not bad thanks at all. For, thanks for coming out. Absolutely. Um, so why don't you, you know, this this is started out life as a regular street car. Yes, it did. I actually drove it here for three months uh, to class um, okay, before it ended right. up going to the beginning of the process of what it is today. Okay. And and what exactly? Uh, now, you know, there's lots of different aspects of racing. You know, you have Formula One, NASCAR, obviously this car is not of that caliber. Um, what, it, what exactly, what, what dynamic of the sport is this car built for? Um, this is mainly built for drifting. Drifting um, is a sport that is a subjective sport, judged mainly on your style, um, your impact to the crowd overall. Um, as well as your speed and angle throughout an entire course designated by a series of judges. Okay, so, so you don't necessarily race for first place with a group of other cars. You, you go through the track, maybe one or two at a time, and it's sort of like, you could almost say it's like a figure skating competition where there's judges that actually judge how, how clean you are in your, in your driving still. Correct. Skills. Um, basically what it is is in, we'll qualify starting off, Usually in the Pro Series, they'll do it in a top 32 format. Um, or actually, should I say, not so much the top 32, they try and narrow it down to a top 32 based off of a judging style that is based out of 100 points. Um, once again, the factors of speed, angle, and overall impact of your run as far as a panel of three judges. And they will deem um, how many points you got, once again, out of 100. Okay, and, and this it's a relatively young sport, and, and it kind of... I don't know. It, 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 I think initially when it came out, it was it was popular or originated in Japan. It was. It was one of those things. Uh, I know the first time I ever saw it was introduced to me by a friend whose father actually, oddly enough, worked for Nissan. Um, from there, we ended up watching literally you, not even YouTube at that point. It was like LimeWire or like Kazam, or whatever that was. So this was. is going back to. Probably the late night, well, early, early 2000s. 2000s. Okay. I think the first time I ever saw it was around seventh grade. Um, okay. So that would have been around 2000, 2000 2001. Okay. Um, and it was one of those things, as soon as I saw it, it was something I needed to do. Uh, my whole process of getting to it was just, how, what do I got to do? What do I got to save? Who do I need to like end up getting involved with? Right. Um, that is going to teach me how to do this, which was, it took some time to do that. I started out with a front wheel drive car. Um, got to know a little bit more about motorsports as a whole. I started out drag racing. Um, from drag racing, I actually saw the beginning of what is now Club Loose. Um, it's an organization run out of Englishtown, New Jersey, Raceway Park. Um, and they used to do it in the parking lot right behind where the drag race course was. Okay. Um, Le legally. They would legally, yes. Sanctioned. Absolutely. Yeah, so Absolutely. This, is not, this is not something that you take out to Front Street and, and you no, race for no, big No, no, no. By something. all means, it's actually very dangerous to do on the road. You really don't get a great concept of what it actually takes to drift right. um, on a road because it's not the same as what it would be on a racetrack. There's a lot of obvious factors that go into it. potholes, curbs. Um, people. Other people, cars, cars. yeah, um, right. Just the general safety of things that you should not be doing on the road, is in all reality. Um, but that being said, English Town provides an area, a beautiful road course, as a matter of fact, um, to anybody that does want to drift. You pay an entry fee, and pretty much anybody that comes out with a safe car that is rear wheel drive has a LSD or a welded differential in it. Right. Some suspension and a bucket seat, and you can go out and drive with anyone else. Well, that that sounds pretty cool. So. 
So this car, uh, obviously, you know, going back to the fact that it's made for a track, this car is not street legal. It was, like you said, it was at one time, and it's been it's been extensively modified to the point where it's 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 built for that type of track racing and not another sport. It is. So there's a lot that we take from other sports, um, whether it be NASCAR. As a matter of fact, a lot of the Pro Series cars have started to take on things such as G-force transmissions, which are four speeds versus a normal five speed or a six speed that would come in these cars. Right. Um, they've also adapted things such as the quick change rear ends, where it's much faster to change rear end differential gearing. Um, Which helps you in different situations. Right, given the course, given right. the speed of the course, um, Some, maybe even given your comp competitor, maybe they're a little bit faster, you can change it out in, in order to keep up. Um, things of that nature that have been taken from other motorsports that really can handle the beating that we put on these things. Okay, so yeah, so this is, this is <laughs> and it's just interesting because you know you 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 look at just the general shape of this car, maybe from what you can see here. Now we're going to take you more into this, and you just kind of go, well, it's a race car. It sort of looks like it has a roll cage in it, but you know, just looking here at the at the at the front of the vehicle, uh, there's no headlights, there's no turn signals. Now they're 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 obviously used. There to are sometimes I'm in the middle of prepping for the season still, so right. those are some of the last things to go back on the car. It's right. made a priority of you know suspension, making sure the motor's up to par, making right. sure obviously no leaks, the general things that you want to take care of maintenance for, um, but also just making preventative maintenance, changing fluids, um, right. making sure everything operates the way you really want it to, because you don't want to go out to the track and question something and maybe be like ah maybe that would be fine. Right. You don't want to find out at the track when you're literally right. at the peak of what the car is supposed to perform at, what it's supposed to be doing, and how hard you're pushing it to its limits as well. Yeah, and I, you know, I can imagine in that respect, it's your it's your safety. Mm -hmm. It's making sure your car does not suffer some horrible mechanical defect mm -hmm. that injures you and or the car takes your vehicle out for a season and then right. you're you're out or anybody else I may or be any, on track or, with as right well. or in in your other competitors right. so so right. yeah um so what what are we what are we looking at here with the hood what, like, um <laughs> most of the a lot of the panels on the car as a whole have been changed in order to, for either lightness purposes um strength in some areas Right. Um, but a lot, mostly for lightening of the car. Right, and, and, and you know, in terms of making the car lighter, that naturally makes everything faster. So even if you don't do anything to a, a stock engine, making your vehicle lighter automatically, due to physics, makes it faster. So, right. So, I know. Uh, I remember learning years ago um, in the, when I started drag racing. I was always told 100 pounds takes about a tenth, off, tenth of a second off of your timing. That can be applied anywhere else as far as motorsports car go. In the case that the lighter your car is, the faster it accelerates and the faster it slows down as well. Yeah, and so and imagine slowing down is, is, is as important as going fast. In our sport, it absolutely is. <laughs> because we will go from a turn, um, in some cases, where it'll be anywhere as high as 100 miles per hour, right. down into a hairpin where you're changing sometimes two years just to get into the speed that you need to be into, right. and scrubbing off a ton of speed as far as angle with the car as well. Right. So this is a uh, this is a carbon carbon fiber. This is this is, part of the car has been replaced with carbon fiber, as a few other parts of the car have been as well, which you'll see as we go throughout. Okay, um, and, and, and carbon fiber is is different than fiberglass. It is this this weave pattern is not. Uh, it, it might be hard to see with the camera, but it's it's actually it's a, it's a fabric. On, on with a with a laminated layer on top. Yeah, it's basically an epoxy that goes over the top. Um, it hardens and it actually has the strength, the same strength as most metals used in cars will be, and quite a bit less weight overall. Right. I mean, the hood that came off of this car, it would take two people, no question, to. Um, this I can take off and move around completely by myself. Wow. Where the other one, it literally, like as soon as you picked up the front, you're just like, wow, this is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, and and so you know, that's a huge piece of weight, just savings right there. Now the fenders themselves, the, the fenders on this are fiberglass? The fenders are fiberglass. Okay. Um, the front and rear fi uh, fenders are both fiberglass. Um, once again, the metal panels from the factory, extremely heavy. Um, I, from what the car originally weighed to what it is now, I dropped from, I think it was 
I want to say around 3,500 pounds, and we're down to 2,515 with me in the car. Wow, so that's literally, it's like taking a full-size, a regular sedan family car and, and chopping a third of the weight off of it. So that'd be like much. chopping a third of the car off. Yes, it really is. And we have, which we will get into as well, uh, there have been significant parts of this car chopped out. Yeah, okay. Well, why don't we... Um, why don't we take the hood off okay. and we'll 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 uh, we'll take a look at what's what's underneath the hood. Absolutely. Okay. So these these pieces here these are uh, they're, the, they're, these are quick release hood pins. Okay. Um, they're the aero style. Some people have hood pins that I, you can actually see sticking out of the car with the um, cotter pin or whatever they might use in order to hold it in there. Right. Um, I chose to go something that just happened to be a little bit more aerodynamic is not so much aerodynamic, just clean looking. Okay. And you push the push. You push right there. Push that'll pop down. that up. You pull that back and we can pull it back all the way and the hood comes okay. off. Okay. All right. There we go. So now that we have the hood off, um, what I think is pretty cool about this is you can see that parts of the car are in fact dirty. And I, the, the thing that's different that a lot of people I think that maybe aren't used to seeing a car that's been run is they expect a show car. And really a show car is a car that's clean and usually rides on a trailer and, and people ooh and ah at it and it doesn't really do anything other than be kind of held up on a pedestal as, as, as opposed to a car that gets dirty and wears out. Garage so, queens versus track monsters. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So that's where some of this dirt came from. Not mm -hmm. that the car is driven off road, but the last track you said it's been a muddy winter. And yeah, the last track day, it actually rained on the last day that we were there. Um, so in that case from other people um, tend to go off course every now and again. Um, I can actually say I was not one of those people. Okay. <laughs> um, that being said, it ended up putting a lot of dirt on the track. So naturally running through it and just as, at the speed that we do, it kicks up quite a bit. Right. Um, also, I've removed my fenders in order to drop weight. Um, so the better part of the front end of the car is missing, which would normally protect the car from getting any of the dirt and other things right. inside your engine bay that most people don't want to clean on a regular basis. Right. Mm, right. That being said, I don't mind cleaning it, and my engine bay is relatively easy to clean at the same time. Sure. That being said, I didn't get a chance to clean it. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, the, normally there'd be a, a fender liner on the inside, and in fact, we did an episode uh, a few episodes back where I changed a fender on an Audi, and part of that job was just getting this inner fender liner out, which you obviously don't even have, let alone the right. sheet metal that used to be here. Correct. So that's, again, a weight reduction. And, and because it's a car on a track, you, you don't care about that. Yeah, stuff. there are some people that will do like the tubbed um, front ends as far as like you might see in drag racing, especially the front wheel drive drag racing cars. They tend to do it in order to fit the much larger drag Bigger radials tires. in order to get right. up there. Um, in my case, I actually like the look of it, and it makes it much easier for me to work on certain parts of the car. Sure, you can, you, can, there. you can just get right in and... and right, I mean, normally where normally I wouldn't be able to stick my hand in like that, I can now. And that right. makes it so much easier to replace anything that's down there, especially accessing some of the parts that are on the lower part of the engine. Right. And uh, in terms of the engine, uh, I understand this is, this is obviously not the engine that came in this car. It's a, it's a four-cylinder engine, which was the original engine, but this one is different. And can you tell us how this one is different? Correct. Um, actually, this is the motor that would come in this car in Japan. Um, here in America, they like to give us cars that don't make as much power anywhere else in the world. It's true of German cars, of right. Italian cars, of Japanese cars. You name it. Right. And that could be for, I guess, various reasons, emission reasons. Uh, uh, people are more concerned about fuel economy versus power Correct. in some countries. Correct. And uh, so how did, you, if this engine came from Japan, you obviously don't just like pick up the phone and call Japan and they ship you an engine. No, you don't. Right. You would have to go through an import, um, importing business, which I actually currently work for at this point in time, now named Elite JDM. Um, they can, we can get you motors. Um, at various different Japanese applications. There's quite a few motors that are desirable in exact same chassis across seas, but we don't get those motors. We get, more often, it's the cases of emissions. Right. Um, we're so strict on them more than anywhere else in the world to a certain degree, right. um, especially if you live in California. Right. Um, so in that case, this motor was not allowed here. 
It actually comes in a naturally aspirated versus a turbocharged, which this happens to be, mm -hmm. which we'll get into in a little bit. Right. Um, but in this case, mine was imported. Um, we ended up putting it in. It makes 200 horsepower versus the American 165 horsepower engine. Right. Um, so right off the bat, I'm working with a lot more than what I normally would have had from an American series engine. Right. And 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 so you know the the parts for this engine, you can't. You know, you can't walk into a Pep Boys and say, hey, I need a valve cover gasket for my, my 240 right. because this is not even the same, you know, cam cover, valve cover that that car came with. So now now you're dealing with a whole nother set of just parts really for this engine. And you'd have to go to a place like you said, like where you work elite Correct. GDM, yeah. to, to get that kind of hardware. Right, right. We know all the proper part numbers and stuff that in most other Places, if you were to walk into a Pep Boys, they couldn't, you couldn't just tell them I have an SR20 DET, in which the case this is, right. and they could give you the normal parts. You have to go through an outlet such as ours at Elite JDM um, or various other outlets um, in order to get that. Right. Um, so, in that case, it makes it a little bit harder um, to a certain degree to get parts for this, but this has become such a popular motor here in America that, in this case, for this, they're not too bad. Right. Which is part of why I was happy to go with this motor because I don't want to be going to the ends of the earth and calling Australia and Japan and all these other places that might have Japanese cars right. in right. order to get the parts that I need for them. Right. And so, um, so the engine is uh, is is what we call it's what we call built on the inside. Yes. Yeah. Um, once again, it started out with 200 horsepower, which is considered at the crank, not at the wheels. Um, crank is the, the at the at the end of the engine, not 200 horsepower at the wheels. But really, when we rate engines, we rate them at the crankshaft. Right. If so. you were to read your motor trend, your car and track, um, or road and track, should I say, um, they're always going to have brake horsepower. It's very rare that they have wheel horsepower. Right. Um, that's how we tend to dyno, rate, rate them. dyno our cars, so we can tune them in directly. Right. Um, engine dynos are great, but it takes the whole engine coming out of the car and putting it back in, which consumes quite a bit of time. Right, and so an engine dynamometer is, is a machine where you would take the engine out of the car, put it in a essentially a measuring device, mm -hmm. running the engine without the car and just seeing how much power it essentially makes. Right. So I, I see what you're saying. You know, you want to you kind of have everything together to see how it all really fits and maybe where you need to do your adjustment to get more power. Correct. Right. Um, I did quite a bit of research into this motor. I had it in another car prior to, so I had a little bit of experience with it. Mm -hmm. Once again, attending school here, it brought my understanding of what it takes to make a motor not only powerful, but the way it should be designed in order to fit your style of motorsport. Right. Drag racing, you just want to make as much power as you can. Right. Um, and it doesn't matter so much as where it comes on. More often than not, the power will be at the top end of a motor very high in the RPM range. Right. Um, not that our motors aren't built to a certain degree like that, but I built my motor to the way I drive, and I like a really responsive and a really peppy setup where I can get off gas and get right back on it, and all the power that I had before is still there. Still there, right. Right. So you're, so, not, you're not waiting for the power to kind of build like maybe you would in, in some other, like you said, some other forms of motorsport. Right, right. Because you're constantly, you're, you're on and off the throttle the as, you're, as you're driving. Time. And for example, just to contrast to a sport like NASCAR, those guys are flying around the track. They're not really taking their foot off the gas all the time. No, they're not. They're, they're just foot to the floor trying to pass one another. So I get, yeah, that makes sense. That's right. very different. So I mean, in our style of sport, as far as where the engine will be, we can go anywhere from literally bouncing off the rev limiter, which basically prevents your car from blowing up, mm -hmm. which you won't see so much in NASCAR, right. um, where it's meant to do that as well as go really low and bring the power back up again because that's how that's the style of driving that, I said, that we do. Like I said, once again, like we'll go from somewhere where you're doing almost 100 miles per hour mm -hmm. and then come into a turn where you drop down to like 45 right. or even maybe slower in some cases. Right. And, and yeah, and you can imagine, sure, a street car could go 45 miles an hour, but to get back to that 100 very quickly, you need a lot of you need a lot of energy to make that happen. Correct. So, so. in the case of this motor, what I decided to do is I broke the whole thing back down from what it was. Um, we did upgraded pistons. I actually raised the compression in the motor versus, which is kind of unconventional um, in most terms of turbocharging. Um, but I wanted something that was really res responsive. And I knew with the tuner that I used, right. um, a guy out of California named Race Tune, um, he, I, I had the confidence in his ab tuning ability to build it accordingly. And, and tuning uh, is, is basically 
kind of adjusting the car with the computer. Correct. T tuning, uh, basically changing numbers, how the sensors on the engine are interpreted, and how much fuel and when things happen. How much fuel, how much right. air coming in, um, what the turbocharger is doing, um, right. the whole nine. So in that case, in order to accommodate all those other additions in fuel and air and things like that, we upgraded the pistons, we upgraded the rods, because that is, happens to be one of the weak points in these motors. Right. Once you're over 400 horsepower, roughly, that's like kind of what we use as like the marking point, the rods are unpredictable. So um, the, the, the connecting rods are the part that literally connects the piston to the crankshaft, and what you're saying is they're normally like a big strong I-beam and they sort of get a little spaghetti-like. Right, and yeah. if they get too much pressure on them, they tend to bend like that, and then they come out the side of the engine, and, and nobody then, likes and that, because that then, just ruins your day. And then, and then you're, you can't fix your car. Correct, <laughs> correct. You so, start all over. So uh, moving this way in the engine bay, there's this, there's this uh, wrap that we see here. What, what is that, that wrap? That, that wrap at? is the uh, exhaust manifold, which connects to the turbocharger. Okay. Um, in this case, it is wrapped because the motor tends to produce a ton of heat. Right. Um, in which and case, see, mine happens to be right next to my brake, brake master brake, cylinder. Brake, which, yeah, we're, we're familiar with some of these brake components from other, other shows, and you have this nice heat shield here mm -hmm. to protect your, your plastic master cylinder reservoir. I as imagine. well as the fluid inside. The fluid, absolutely. And then you even have this gold foil around the uh, brake booster to yep. reflect that heat back. Correct. To, to keep your brakes from cooking before you actually have to step on the pedal. Exactly, as long as, uh, along with the firewall as well. Um, this is actually a heat film that was developed by NASA. Um, this is what they use on their satellites and things like that, where their, their thrusters go. Oh, so that's, go. that's the gold foil you see. Yes. You can buy that now for, for automotive applications. Yes, you can. There's quite a few sites that sell it. I need some NASA parts for my car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's certainly not the cheapest sticky stuff I've ever bought. But, yeah, uh, but, it, but if it works, and it more importantly keeps your brakes from that blowing does. up when you need them, uh, that's, that's, that's cool. So, th so, the, so underneath here, there's just steel tubes, and then that goes to the turbocharger. And we actually have a turbocharger right yes, here. Um, and uh, the way a turbocharger is going to work, essentially, is you have what's known as a, a hot side and a cold side. And the cold side is, is where you're going to pull in this, this fresh air that you and I are breathing. And this is a, a fan assembly on the inside. I always like to refer to it as a hair dryer. That's the way most people can seem to associate with the. Pest. Okay, that makes that makes sense. You got you got an inlet and an outlet and a hair dryer, and this guy's gonna gonna spin, and as it spins, it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna suck air in and compress it and blow it out. Correct. And uh, what this what a turbocharger does is eventually it, it's gonna shove more air into the engine, which ultimately is gonna make the engine go faster. It's correct. It's uh it's like. I, I say this in class, it's like strapping an oxygen tank to your back and then running down the street. You're going to have this air forced into your lungs, which is going to yes. make your muscles work faster, and it works the same way with a car. Right. The, uh, the way that that spinning happens is this part here hooks up to the exhaust manifold, and there's a turbine attached through a cross shaft to the front. So as those hot exhaust gases blow past the exhaust turbine, it forces air more on the inside. So it's kind of a chicken and the egg sort of situation. The more you blow the hot side, the more the cold side blows, the more the cold side blows, ultimately you're gonna spin the hot side even faster. So Correct. there's a so there's a little bit of a delay and, and they call that turbo lag. Yes, which of, mine does have a bit of, but it's not too bad. Like I said, those, com those pistons that we put in, we raise the compression a little bit. Right. Um, squeezing a little bit more air in there right. helps to aid in that lagginess. Right, and, and you know, so you have, you have this raised compression of the pistons, and then on top of that, you're shoving more air into it. So you're really, you're taking a big volume of air, and you're really squeezing it hard, and that is where you get a lot of your heat from. That's, Correct. You know, goes back to the, the thermal dynamics of, of compressing gases, yep. and uh, consequently, from engine performance class, uh, that means that you have to run a very high octane fuel in this car. Yes, I do. Uh, the fuel that we use is actually leaded. Um, 110 octane minimum, um, wow. usually VP racing fuels. Um, that's a company that I trust the most. Um, but in that case, uh, it tends to be on the more expensive side as far as running things, but it gives me that peace of mind that I'm not going to have early detonation in the motor, right. ultimately destroying my engine. Right, and, and, and you know, for, in terms of uh, being an athlete and eating healthy, you're not going to win the race if you just throw down a Big Mac, so you're going to want to no. make sure that you feed it 
good food. Correct. Yeah, so. you want to be that guy that's getting the protein shakes and all that other stuff that's supposed to make you healthy versus the uh, the orange drink and the Big Mac. Right. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So this this right here, this is this is the cold side inlet. It is. And um, you got a, a, an open style air cleaner. We've done those in, mm -hmm. in a past show. And then you have a tube that kind of snakes under here, and then the turbo's packed under there. Right. And what then, it does from there is basically it sucks the fresh air in here. Fresh air in here. Mm -hmm. It compresses it, like we were saying before. The hot side will spin the, the cold side, ultimately forcing air into this tube right here, okay. which comes down in through an intercooler, which is a heat exchanger. I like to compare it for um, to like basically a radiator, but just for air. Right. It so cools it's a, the air. It's down. an air-to-air -air radiator. Exactly. And and going back to the the, the thermal dynamics, we've compressed that this air that was cool. We've compressed it now and it's hot, we've raised its temperature. And uh, so we have to actually pass it through this, the intercooler, like right. you're saying, to shed some of that heat as you're going through. Exactly. And then the pipe comes over. Comes up over here and it'll run into the intake manifold, which ultimately supplies the engine with all of the actual air that is necessary to mix with the fuel. Right. So, so, so really, I mean, you know, when people talk about, you know, I want to put a turbocharger on my car, it's not just a piece that you buy in a box and you drop it in the engine. There's, there's some real plumbing yes. that goes into this. I mean, you have, you know, these are all, you know, welded seams that you have here. And uh, you really had to think about how this had to fit with the hood closed yeah, yeah. To, to make this fit. And it seems sort of like most people would think the air comes in here, it goes right into the engine. And no. it's like, no, it comes in. And, snakes around and comes out through the right front. there are certain applications in certain cases this case um, this car does happen to come with a turbocharged from the factory already mm -hmm. um, in the cases of when you don't have a car that's already turbocharged in the factory it's that much more work yeah I can imagine in that. certain cases like in this um, this actually the turbo that a charger that I have on here would be a direct replacement for a factory turbo believe it or not really yeah you can run a lot of the same stuff that you would normally on the car once again you're gonna want to upgrade things like the intercooler because a turbo such as that will generate so much heat, and heat is number one an engine's worst enemy, as well as a turbo. Sure. If either one of them are getting too much, you're gonna burn up your oil, it's not gonna be lubricated the way it's supposed to be, Right. and you risk serious engine failure. Yeah, failure. yeah. one of the things that turbos do, and they're, 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 they're unfortunately notorious for this, is they spin so fast, that turbine shaft on the inside spins at like 150,000 RPM. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a mind-boggling speed, and there's oil, uh, which is supplied from the engine's oil pump, pressurizing that shaft to lubricate it, as well as engine coolant, mm -hmm. trying to cool that shaft at the same time. And turbocharged engines, along with this mass of heat right here, they really tend to beat up oil. They do. And even in a street car uh, that's a factory turbocharged car, things like oil changes are so critical. Yes, and, and if you want it, imperative. They really are. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's uh, it's amazing to me how many people buy a turbocharged car even today and the salesperson says oh yeah come you know don't don't worry about the oil change you know right. it's it will take care of it and you know you really want to be checking your car checking your oil making right. sure you have good clean oil in there for this absolutely setup. and especially in the case of turbochargers more often than not they tend to consume a little bit more oil than say a non-turbocharged engine oil. right because and again because you're 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 packing the air into things so you're really kind of blowing the oil around the inside essentially absolutely and in this case actually this car it happens to come with a really superior um oil baffling system within the valve cover which which, which prevents right which prevents that oil from getting blown right around. and also in order to prevent any excess buildup and pressure within inside the engine we have this right here which is a catch can that any extra blow by as we call it right um that gets caught up here will just vent right into this can and I can empty it as needed, um, thus preventing any excess pressure right. or random oil buildup inside the engine. Yeah, and, and, and to just go back to the, again, the difference between a street car and, and a car built for the track, you know, we're dealing with a, an engine that is, is, was not here. So you couldn't normally put that engine in a, in a street car and technically have it be legal at that point. There's ways around it. Depends on what state you leave it, live in. Uh, okay, but, but but I'm saying that I mean, it, and it, not that it's illegal, but it's something that you know there was a reason why maybe the federal government said, Nissan, you can't sell a car here Absolutely. with that engine. Um, why don't you tell us what this 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 thing is? Absolutely, this is a uh, what we call a blow off valve. Right. Um, it releases, and in the case of turbocharging, um, when the car is under load or wide open throttle, pedal to the metal, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. um, it builds up that pressure 
And then once in, you- In this pipe. In this pipe, which ultimately there's pressure in here, all the way to here and here as well. Um, but once we let off and we don't, we're not in boost as we call it anymore, right. there's still pressure that remains within inside the system. Um, if that pressure has nowhere else to go, it will ultimately find a way out. Um, whether it's through a seal, like a coupler in this case, or somewhere else further down the line. So in this case, what we use is a blow-off valve, which releases that excess pressure within these tubes and the intercooler here as well, okay. and vents it to the atmosphere. And, and, that, and that makes a very distinctive sound yes, when, when people shift with a turbocharged car and people either, I, I happen to like the sound. <laughs> you probably do too. I do too. Um, but that's, that's the noise a lot of people hear and they associate with the turbocharged cars, that pressure release and that happens when you shift and when you close the throttle, that's it venting that pressure. Exactly. Very cool. So, um, well, uh, I think we've gotten a pretty good uh, look at what's going on here under the hood. Why don't, we, um, why don't we try to take a look at what you've done inside the car? Absolutely. So we're here uh, looking at the inside, the interior. Well, I should say the lack <laughs> of the interior. Uh, there's obviously nothing here. Um, again, this is for, for weight savings, and you really don't care about an interior in a race car. No, you don't. That's just more weight. Um, in the case of this car, the actual the door skins that were would have been right about here. And the windows. Um, and the windows There's as no well. Windows. The motor assembly that goes along with the windows, um, all weight. And everything that I could get rid of weight-wise, I was getting rid of, and that was one of the first things to go. Right, and, and in terms of getting rid of that weight, you, you, you added this roll cage you, you built this yourself yes and it obviously it's steel it's not plastic it is it's made out of uh, actually what we call DOM steel mm -hmm. um, which basically DOM is steel that when it's bent it won't lose any thickness in the structure of it which is very key in the case of building something that's supposed to protect your life in the event of the car rolling over right and and I in you know you have some of the structure of the original car left but you're really you're dependent upon this this roll cage to really keep you safe you I know? am and and so obviously that's not something you want to skimp on and I guess if you had this with a car with an interior that would really kind of affect maybe where you could run things whereas here you've, you've literally just cut a hole through the dashboard and said well this has this pipe has to go here right and so I don't care about that speaker there's no there's you know there's no radio, there's no air conditioner, there's no uh, airbags. No creature comforts in no, any form. No, no defroster. Um, the windshield is, is, is not even glass, it's plexiglass? Yes, it is. It's actually a uh, Lexan, as Lexan, it's known, okay. right. um, by the 3M branding at least. Um, it is a shatterproof um, plastic that, once again, saves some weight. Um, in the case of my case, um, considering I'm not professional at this level, nobody pays me to build this car. Um, it actually saved me some money. Um, right. Normally, in the case of putting all the windows back into the car, alone, the front window was $250 from a company like Safelite. Right. I was able to do the front window, the rear windshield, as well as the side panel, the side windows, the mm -hmm. quarter windows as well, for under, 100, under $199. Right, and, and the way that they're fastened, too, they're just riveted in. So if you have to change them at some point, you just drill out the rivets, pull the windshield out and then you can you could work on parts of this roll cage it's not like you'd have to send the car out to a body shop to get that fixed or right. taken out so you can just work on the inside of it exactly exactly it does make the ease of you know once again working on the inside of the car in any form especially with the roll cage it makes it very difficult to get into the rear right um it's basically trying to collect them over a jungle gym for a the best explanation that I could explain. Right, and, 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 and it takes me to the next thing. I mean, this, you're the only person in this car. There's no back seat, there's no passenger seat. And the seat itself, is, is a, it's, a, it's a true racing seat. It's not the factory seat in the car. It is. And uh, it gives you, I guess, better support. It does give me better support. I actually get a little bit higher on the side so I don't go shifting back and forth in extreme Gs around turns. Um, also, it is FIA certified, which it needs to be in order to race competitively. And that's a, like a, a certification standard for safety? Right, it's a sanctioning body, the same thing that would be used in any SCCA racing. Um, basically the same guys that do IndyCar, um, any form of professional racing, FIA has to certify um, seats and other aspects of the car as far as safety goes. Right, and, and uh, in, in terms of the seat, there's no adjustments 
for the seat. This seat is it's literally made for you. Right. And and the the spacing between here and the dash, it's fixed. You can't move the seat like you can't flip it forward to get into the back. It's just it's like it's made for you. Correct. The car, uh, the seat, should I say, is planted exactly where I want it to be. Um, unless you are six foot three and lengthy like I am, you probably wouldn't be that comfortable in here. Um, even if you weighed a few extra pounds, the seat is actually meant for somebody of my size. You buy seats according to actually waist size, believe it or not. That you really? buy your so it's like, it's like tail, it's like a suit. It is. It's it like really is. It's fit, fitted for a suit. Wow. Right. Right. So I noticed that you have a fire extinguisher. I do. Um, right next to the uh, right, right within arm's reach. Right. Um, is that that's not there for looks. No, it's not. It's actually mandatory to race in the club, like I said, club loose, like that I am involved with. Um, or any of the other competitive series that I'm looking to get involved with in the future, you have to have a fire extinguisher within arm's reach. I prefer to have it even closer than that because that way it's easier. I'm not fumbling with it or anything of that nature. Right, and it's and it's all it's all strapped down and bolted in with a quick release. It is. It's not going anywhere. Uh, so that way you can. It's not flying around the inside of the car. Hit there's, me in the face as I go around turns. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there's no there's no drink holder. There's no ashtray. There's no iPhone mount. There, you know, you can't have anything loose in the car. Like. Nothing. Nothing at Nothing. all. Nothing. It would just fly. It would be a projectile. Yes, yeah, so I would go from one turn to that side, and if I were to go to that side, it would probably come flying up and around past me, and I don't want anything flying around no. my car. No, that would be <laughs> bad. That would be bad. Uh, so I noticed you got like you got this that that stick there. That's the the gear shifter. It's this one here ma is manual transmission. Correct. Um, five speed, six speed. This one's a five speed. It's actually the uh, factory transmission that came with the SR20 engine that we were talking about before. Okay. Um, they're pretty strong transmissions. Um, I haven't had any problems with it, and I have been well, relatively well known for braking transmissions. I'm pretty <laughs> good at it. Um, this one's held up great so far, and it actually turns out that they're on the cheaper end. Um, really. Once again, as far as racing and trying to start out, um, you try and keep things as cost effective as possible. Um, I can pretty regularly pick up one of these transmissions for about $250. I would oh, that's rather... A, that, that's a bargain. Absolutely. I'd yeah. rather run this transmission and blow it up every weekend versus spending a whole ton of money and On getting a custom really, built. Right. Yeah, yeah. Which will be harder to find parts for. I'll mm -hmm. have to wait for parts when I need them versus going to, you know, a local forums, like Facebook groups even, or junkyards in order to find the transmission that I want to run in here. Wow. So that, so what's the other stick then? The other one, this re, this uh, handle right here um, runs my hydraulic handbrake. Um, I have a separate set of calipers in the rear, which are the grabbing forces that slow you down. Um, normally you'd only have one set in the back. I have two because I run a completely separate braking system. Um, you can see up here that there's a reservoir that holds that brake fluid. Normally it would be tucked up underneath the dash um, just for the, cleanly, the purpose of cleanliness within the cabin. Right. Um, but in the case of showing it off, I brought it out. Um, and then there's a line that runs right here into the back um, in order to distribute the fluid accordingly to each side. So that's like, uh, I mean, we, we did a past show on a, a master cylinder for a brake system, which is what your foot is. Essentially, that's a separate hydraulic brake that you can you can pull back on that lever exactly and that's just going to lock up the rear wheels Correct. and and in this particular sport that's that's what's going to help you start that that drift correct it's, it'll help us to, to initiate in certain turns um, whether it's our entering turn or in other cases when we're transitioning and we need to slow down a little bit we'll use it in order to scrub off some speed as well right um, so you st the car still has a regular brake pedal it does. And front it has brakes and everything. Normal front brakes. Um, they're not the brakes that originally came on the car. They are um, actually off of a um, another Nissan that has a much better factory braking system. Um, but I do have the regular brake pedal, mm -hmm. and then I have this um, in order to control my handbrake, which would normally be right here. Most people call it a parking brake. You just pull it up when you want to park. Right. Um, we tend to use it for a little bit more of a fun purpose in this case. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, so the, again, you know, if you were to park this somewhere. I mean, we have it on a lift here in the shop. If it was just sitting on the ground, it could just roll away. It there's, would. There's um, no, there's, or you could leave it on gear, I guess. I leave it in gear, and then just for safety purposes, I'll also chalk the wheels just to make sure. Right. Um, that's pretty cool. So looking at your, um, the, the gauge panel there, um, you know, we said that there's no heater, no air conditioner. No, there's you not. Know, no power windows, no rear defroster. Any, you know, so what do those buttons do if, if that stuff's all gone from the car? Essentially what I've done is I've changed also the factory computer that would normally control um, all the functions of the car as far as turning on all the readiness monitors, the sensors that we were talking about before. 
um, that control all the inputs from the engine. Um, so what I do is I have, I have everything linked where normally you would turn your key on like this. I don't have a key anymore. That's literally just to keep the steering wheel so I can preventing it from locking. All of my controls for the engine um, and then additional things such as windshield wipers in the future, my lights, all that is all controlled through this panel right here. Wow. Um, as well as my ignition. Normally where you turn this key and it would turn over, I have a button that I press instead. So you have a, like, basically it's, it's almost like a, you know, you see an old movie where people go to fly an airplane or a helicopter and they're flipping switches. Correct. And then they start the engine, it's kind of the same setup. Yep. I, is, the advantage of that is, is I, I guess when you're building the car, you can, you know, you're, you're kind of taking out the stock system, the stock wiring, so you wouldn't, you know, you're, you're adding your own stuff. Correct. It's custom built. Once again, also through doing things like this, I was able to get rid of what would be called the factory body harness, which would normally control things such as lights, um, some of the other functions in front of the car. Um, I got rid of all that. My harness is completely made from scratch, once again, to save on weight. Right. And also, as far as diagnosing issues quickly at the track, you want to be able to go right to it. And I know exactly where everything is because we were the ones that put it in there in association with uh, my coworker and uh, owner of Elite JDM, Nick D'Alessio. That makes, that makes total sense. So you can, you know, you, you, can, you can narrow the problem down quickly. You don't have to go, uh, you know, like we would do in a shop situation, you have to go look up the wiring diagram and then take panels off to get to things. Everything's kind of right there. And exactly. Diagnosis, that would normally take a couple hours or sometimes an hour or two, even more in a shop. Um, we can do in minutes on, on track side. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so I noticed that your steering wheel is not attached to your car. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> is that... <laughs> How does that work and uh, is it safe? It does, is safe. Does it come off while you drive? It does not. Once I put it on here, you'll hear it. Oh, if I can get it to go on. It locks into place. Once it's locked into place, I can't pull it off. It doesn't go anywhere. Wow. And it's also for the ease of, once again, me being a lengthy person, it makes it very difficult for me to get in and out of the car with the roll cage and the steering wheel still attached. Being able to take the steering wheel off like this, um, putting it up on the dashboard or hanging it over here on the e-brake and the shifter, makes it a lot easier for me to get outside of the car. Right, and, and again, going back to uh, creature comforts that you'd have in a, in a street car, no airbag, no horns, no turn signals, no, no. no washer, you know, no, no wiper washer switch, that no. stuff's just gone. Yep, um, I, once again, through this panel up here, um, we control, as far as turning on the gauges, um, this will turn on my fuel pumps in the rear, as you can hear. Right, and they're pretty loud. They are loud. <laughs> um, and also, it will control my lights for when I have my headlights mounted up. Right. And my rear tail lights just for normal driving. Um, we are required to have emergency lights for when we're on track. It's one of the things that we are able to signify spotters um, and other track workers that maybe we're broken down or we're having an issue of some sort. So you can kind of flash the lights and let people exactly. know that you need help. Exactly. Cool. Um, all right. So. Um, if we take a look over there, you were showing me that that's where your your custom yes. fuse panel is. Right over they're here. Actually, they're actually circuit breakers. They're not yes, fuses. they are. Um, we once again did this for ease of finding issues at the track. Um, my whole fuse panel, which would normally be located up in the engine, sometimes inside the car down by the kick panels, which is basically where your feet would be um, towards the front of the cabin, we have all been relocated right here. Um, we don't have to search through fuses that we have to look at each one and see if it's broken or not. They right. just pop up pop up, and tell us that there's a problem in that circuit. And you have them all nicely labeled over there, so y you can just glance at it and say, oh, this, this doesn't work, and there's the problem. Right. In the case of, you know, say, the one first one I'm looking at is left fan. If that pops up, I know that there's an issue in that circuit, and I go straight to it, fix it in any way that I need to, as long as, as long with the relays that are underneath the car. Once again, they'd be right next to a fuse box or contained in the same fuse box. Um, they've all been labeled and written out on the bottom, so if I'm having an issue with any one of those, I can just go straight to it as well. Very cool. And I notice also, just to go back to the seat briefly, your, your harness, it's not the standard three-point belt that you would have in a regular car. It's, it's a, is it a four-point four point harness? This one is a four-point. It's actually the, um, the buckle on the inside, what we call a cam lock, is set up to be a six-point or a five-point harness, a six-point, should I say, because it would attach on two different points on the floor. Right. Um, so in this case, I just basically push this, that clicks in there. I pull this up over the top. I always kind of compare it to, uh, you know, strapping yourself into a roller coaster. Right. Just loosen this up for a second so I can actually move. It's still in race form. 
Um, yeah, we're not going anywhere right no. now. So <laughs> you don't have to. And it pops in on this side as well. Wow. So you, it's not it's not like you know when you're wearing that, you can't lean forward if something falls on the floor. No, I really can't move at all in all seriousness. I've gone to do it when I go to pull on track and I go to look out the back or something like that and I realize I get caught. Right. But in that case, that's a good feeling because I know if I hit anything really hard in some form or another in some horrible case, um, I will be in good shape as far as safety wise. Nice. Which also goes in conjunction with the padding that we have up here on top of the roll cages. Right. On the roll cage. Um, this is, once again, necessary as far as tech technical inspection to get on track. Anywhere that my head could possibly hit, hit. in the event of an impact. Added padding. So we have it up here in the front, which would be a far stretch. My, essentially, my harnesses would have to fail in order for me to hit that. Right. Same thing here. This one's the more common one that I'll touch, especially with a helmet on because it's just kind of bulky. It's pretty close. And then there's another one back here. So if I were to get hit from behind and my head were to hit backwards, it's all padded. Right. And the, and the, and the seat belt is attached. It's to attached to the body. It's actually uh, exactly where the factory uh, mounts would have been for a seat belt. Okay. It's all in those same places. It's just a better seat belt made for right. race track. Much stronger. Um, once again, it's like we were talking about before. It's kind of like a baby seat. Um, it really keeps you really tucked in and you're not going anywhere. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, well, why don't, we, uh, why, don't we, why don't we hop out okay. and um, we'll take a look at the, um, some of the things at the rear or the uh, underside of the car. That sounds good. So we're here. Uh, we got the Joe's car up in the air and we're, we're going to look at some of the, uh, the modified suspension on this, which again is not something that you would find at all on a street car. No, you wouldn't. Um, one of the first things that we did, we added all adjustable arms, um, basically to fine tune the suspension in any form that we want as far as camber adjustments, which is basically the in and out of the wheel angle, um, caster, which is forward and backwards, um, as well as the tie rod adjustments, which have been beefed up because these are something that we tend to break quite a bit of. A lot, lot, lot more stress when you got that wheel turned and the car is exactly. basically pushing sideways Correct. through the turn. And in order to compensate for how much angle that we will throw and in order to keep up with the, the steering to keep up with the rest of what the car is doing, we've actually modified where the tie rod attaches to on the knuckle here. Um, it has been chopped right here and re-welded onto it in order to create a much tighter um, st like steering. Um, from one and a half turns to a full lock, it's now one and a quarter. Um, it is... So you actually have to turn the wheel less to, to make these wheels turn more. Exactly. So it's really, like if you're, if you wouldn't want that in a street car. No, you wouldn't. If you were to be driving, say down, you know, uh, your the highway, highway would be very... You'd feel like a quite, you'd feel every last input that would be coming wow. from the road. Wow. Um, that being said, it changes our steering angle at full lock from the stock 37 degrees um, to anywhere from 55 to 57 degrees of steering angle. So, which so like the, you basically you've shortened the, the turning radius at this point and you had to, you had to replace those control arms and, and modify the steering knuckles and everything to get that done. Correct. And all of the um, attachments of where there would normally be rubber bushings inside of a street car, um, these have all been replaced with solid mount bushings. Um, so everything in the suspension, which creates a very great feel on track, but if you were to drive it on the road, you would be feeling every last bump. Those potholes that are bad now could actually break things in this car. Right. So, so even though it's, it's, it's strong, it, it's strong and meant for a smooth surface. Right, exactly. Gotcha. Yeah, exactly. and I imagine in terms of, uh, you know, ride quality and, you know, again, going back to the street car, you know, your coffee would, would, would bounce out of the center console, your teeth would fall out. The mean streets of Philadelphia would do a number on the car. There's gotcha. no doubt about that. Gotcha. But moving from that to over here, including with the um, solid bushings, um, we've actually done the same thing for everything that's drivetrain included as well. Um, things as far as um, the um, subframe mounts in the rear, the transmission mount and the differential mounts. Anything that would normally flex just due to power or me being as hard on the car as I possibly can. Right. This is it's not letting any movement at all. Right. In in, in a normal street car, you know these bushings they're made out of a, a dense rubber compound, but mm -hmm. it's designed to kind of absorb some of the vibrations from maybe the engine. Right. You know the engine's gonna is gonna have a vibration to it. We're gonna feel some torque when you accelerate. Right. In a, in a normal street car, you don't want that transmitted to the passenger compartment. 
But the, the drawback is, is that movement of that rubber is absorbing the potential energy that would go to the tires, exactly. right? Exactly. So in a race car, it would make total sense to have solid mounts everywhere. Yep. You want every last thing to come down to, you know, this section of the tire. I want all my energy transferring power-wise to those back wheels. Right. Absolutely. Um, and then going from up there, um, right behind was the turbocharger that we were talking about, which once again, the exhaust gases will come out of, run down through this pipe right here, and exit the car towards the back. Right, and this is, you know, this is a this is a huge downpipe. I mean, it it, is. you know, a regular car that might be uh, half, even a, a third of this size, maybe for a smaller yeah. car. Yep. Um, on this, in the case of my car here specifically, we have three in, three inch piping coming off of the turbo, and by the time it exits the car, it's actually four inch. Um, that's more for sound purposes. I wanted a little bit more of a um, unique sound to my car versus the many other SRs that might be on track. Right, and you know, again, uh, not street legal. Nope. No, no, no emissions, no catalytic converter, no pollution controls. As free flowing as possible. And, and you can get away with that because it's not driven on public roads. Exactly. It's only driven on a track, so yep. that makes sense. Uh, what can you tell us about this interesting smooth oil pan you Abs have going on here? Absolutely, this is a, actually an oversized oil pan in order to account for more, more oil in the car. Um, once again, kind of actually distributes heat amongst the oil, as well as inside of it, there are baffling doors. So for the extreme G-forces that we experience during drifting, um, you know, the back and forth transitions, the oil sloshes back and forth the whole time. The baffles inside of here prevent that from happening, thus preventing any oil starvation, and oil starvation leads to a blown up motor. Right, and you certainly don't want that to happen on the track. No, I do not. So um, this, is, this, is, this is really cool. Why don't we... Um why don't we why don't we uh, put the car down mm -hmm. and uh, would you mind starting it up for us? We'll open up to. we'll open up the doors here in the garage because it's it's going to be loud and it's going to smell pretty bad. Certainly. Well, I think it smells good as I'm, you probably do, but yes, I do. some of the crew might think it smells bad. Absolutely. So. So now that we're uh, down here in the car. Um, you're going to walk us through what's involved with uh, starting this, yeah, and, certainly. and I understand it's going to get loud. It is. Okay. So what? What? Since there's no key, uh, what? How do you? How do you start? First, I turn on where my kill switch would be. Okay. Um, and then I turn on my fuel pumps. I let them prime. And then I like to turn on my gauges so I know what's going on as far as engine management, engine monitoring wise. Right. Um, gives me a good idea of what the temperatures are, pressures, all that good stuff. Okay, and then uh, how do you start it? I'm ready if you are. I'm ready. Push this button right here. Right. And it's gonna get loud. Okay. That is pretty loud. Yeah. Yeah, especially since the exhaust is right next to your head. Yes, it is. Um, Want to rev it up? I do. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go like this. Yeah, I'd recommend everybody cover their ears a little okay. bit. Uh, that was sweet, Joe. Thanks for uh, thanks for bringing this down. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This was uh, this was great. I'm Dan Reed. Thanks for watching Car Corner. Race safely. What's that? Yeah, oh. Now, now the camera's rolling. You guys aren't stopping. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know it was on. I didn't either. <laughs> we can be funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So you, you brought me a dirty car yeah, to put I on did. the show. Thanks, thanks, right, thanks. You couldn't you couldn't drive it through the car wash? No, no, no. Stop no. trying to be funny, you're not being funny. Not being funny? No, no, no. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you take a... Stop there. Yeah. Sweet. Whew. Good job, man. Nice. Dude, that was awesome. <laughs> you did that in one shot. <laughs>